Testing. Hi. Hey. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for coming here. I'm really excited to chat today with Nick um, at Celestia. So for those of you who don't know, Nick White um, has had his electrical engineering degree from Stanford. Um, and then he was a co-founder of Harmony. And he spent the last two and a half years building Celestia, where he is COO. And so we're going to spend some time breaking down his views on modular blockchain, how he's seeing that ecosystem. Um, so maybe just to get started, um, how did you, you know, how did you first get into crypto, and what drew you to uh, Celestia specifically? Well, actually, the, one of the first crypto conferences I ever attended was here in Korea. Uh, it was Deconomy in the year 2018, and I just quit my job. I was living in Hong Kong. And I wanted to go full time in crypto, so I flew up here. I didn't know anyone. I didn't have a ticket to the conference. I just kind of like mingled around and talked to people. But I knew I had so much conviction in uh, blockchain, and uh, that was kind of the beginning of my journey. And I ended up joining uh, Harmony uh, as a co-founder and moving back to the Bay Area. And basically, from the very beginning, my uh, desire or like goal was to solve scalability of blockchains because I knew that the underlying technology had so much potential. But until we could actually build these trust-minimized systems that scale, uh, we couldn't actually build things that would be useful for people. And so that was kind of my goal at Harmony. We did staking and sharding, kind of implemented the ETH2 roadmap at the time. Um, but then sharding kind of clearly became a dead end. And uh, at the same time, I discovered this new white paper called Lazy Ledger, which uh, defined a new modular uh, approach to building blockchains that to me solved uh, once and for all a lot of the core problems with blockchain uh, infrastructure, including scaling, among other things. And so that's kind of like the how I got started and how I got to where I am. Um, so although Celestia has been around for a while, and I think this idea of modular blockchains has been around for a while, I think it's definitely entered... Um, it's entered the meta more recently, and I think a lot of people are still trying to wrap their heads around what does it mean to, you know, why do we need a modular architecture? Like, what does it mean to have one? Um, and I think one of the, um, the way that Celestia has kind of explained itself is pretty interesting. So the, uh, the quote is, if Bitcoin is a calculator and Ethereum is a computer, then Celestia is a cloud computer. Um, could you unpack that a little bit for the audience? Like, what does, what does that mean, and, and you know, how does Celestia function in the ecosystem? So that analogy is, is trying to help like, break down sort of the evolution of blockchain architectures from Bitcoin to Ethereum to Celestia in the, in the new modular paradigm. And so we call Bitcoin a, a, like a, a, a calculator because basically Bitcoin was a blockchain that only had one function. It had a very limited number of things that it could do. Basically, you could transfer Bitcoin, and that was kind of it. It's kind of like email. And if you wanted to uh, build something that did, did something different, like a decentralized exchange or NFTs, right, you would have to build an entirely new blockchain and program in that logic to that blockchain. So a calculator is also very limited in the scope of what it can do. right? It can just add and subtract and multiply numbers. That's it. Uh, and so then when Ethereum came along, it generalized this concept uh, to make a blockchain that you could actually uh, run all different kinds of programs on top of it. So if you wanted to build an application that didn't yet exist, you could write a smart contract and it could run on Ethereum. So it's, Ethereum sort of generalized it to a computer. Like a computer is something that, uh, you know, it doesn't just add or multiply. You can load new programs, you can download things and run them, and they, do, they run new applications. Now the problem with Ethereum is that as, as just a one single standalone computer, it kind of comes preloaded with the EVM. And so it's kind of like imagine if you had a laptop that only ran Windows, right? But you wanted to run a Mac app. All of a sudden, you can't actually run. You're limited to the scope of what you can run. And also, Ethereum is sort of like a, uh, a single computer that everyone ha in the world has to share. And so imagine if everyone was trying to use one single computer, it would get, it's like running every app on your computer, eventually it kind of like maxes out uh, the resources right, of the computer and it slows down or crashes. And that's kind of what's happening to Ethereum uh, in various bull markets and even now with the high gas fees. And so where Celestia comes in is it's, it's a cloud computer where in the modern web today, most Web2 applications run in the cloud, meaning that 
someone like Amazon or Microsoft has these very scalable data centers that have vast amounts of very cost uh, effective compute, and you can actually build, like, rent parts of that compute to run virtual machines or like servers to run your application. And that server can have whatever kind of operating system it wants. It can scale up and down on demand. And um, that this is essentially what Celestia and the modular architecture is. Instead of a data center, you have uh, Celestia, which is like a data network. And it provides raw, rather than raw compute, it's raw block space. And then developers come to Celestia they consume that block space and run virtual blockchains called rollups that can be customized and scaled up and down depending on demand. So that's, that's, like the, that's how the analogy makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously scalability, I think, I think, since the beginning has been one of the biggest issues that people have tried to tackle. And there's been a lot of different approaches. There's been the approach of, hey, maybe we should shard um, like sharding has been approach. Um, using you know more hardcore hardware has been another approach, and Celestia is obviously a different approach. Can you kind of compare and contrast these different approaches, and and why you think Celestia's approach is is the correct one here? Yeah, so um, I guess I'll start with sharding and touch on it briefly because sharding now is kind of like faded into irrelevance, I'd say. Um, but the the what sharding tries to do is actually in some ways similar to the modular stack where you take the like one single committee of validators and then you split them up into smaller groups and each one of them runs their own chain and then those chains like actually kind of checkpoint and together and sh try to share this common network of security the problem with sharding is that the way that you rotate validators like everything about it is this very cumbersome and complex and at the end of the day it's like it makes sense as a white paper but then when you try to implement it it doesn't really play out as well as you think. And also, more importantly, it doesn't actually solve the fundamental problem of scalability, which um, I need to maybe spend a little bit of time defining. So um, what's challenging about scaling blockchains is that what makes blockchains powerful is that they are verifiable computers, meaning that people, anyone around the world, can run a node of the chain and verify everything that's happening is following the rules that everyone has agreed upon. And when you, the, the reason that that is hard to scale is that when you increase the number of transactions in the network, every person running a node has to then download and verify more and more transactions. And so if you increase the number of transactions too high, no one is able to run a node anymore. And now you, you just have Google running a massive blockchain that no one can verify. So all of a sudden you lost the whole core value of what blockchains are about. And the problem with sharding is it doesn't, actually make it easier to verify the chain as it scales. Now, another approach to scalability is um, to build, to just basically not even solve scalability <laughs> and, and just make your blockchain really, really big. So things like Solana or like these chains that uh, are, are really fast and have a lot of throughput, they tend to just, what they've done is they've raised the node requirements. So they've they make it so that, like, whereas Ethereum, you can verify it on your laptop. For Solana, you need a very powerful computer with a very high like, bandwidth connection to verify it. And so it's not really solving the problem. What they do do that, that actually does help solve scalability is that they make optimizations that allow you to use the machine of your node more efficiently. So you can parallelize verifying execution you can uh, sort of like gossip data faster. So there are elements that do solve scalability, but at the end of the, end of the day, a lot of the scale up of these kind of systems is just increasing the node requirements. So now, how, is, how are modular blockchains different to this? So modular blockchains are different because they employ two new technologies that fundamentally scale, uh, like scale the uh, verifiability of blockchains. So the first one is one that we are all familiar with in this room, I would think, called rollups. And so what rollups do is they make it so that rather than having to verify every single transaction one by one, you can verify a single proof that all those transactions are valid. And so you compress 
you reduce all that computation down to verifying one thing. So there could be a million transactions. Instead of verifying every single one, you just verify one single proof. So that's a huge you know, uh, advantage over like normal monolithic chains. And then the other component to scaling uh, modular blockchains is a technology called data availability sampling. So in order for any blockchain to function, you need all of the uh, transaction data to be public information. It needs to be, have been published to everyone who is running a node. And um, unfortunately, the only way to verify that data has been published is you have to download all of it yourself. And of course, that doesn't, if you increase the number of transactions, then every node has to then download that much more data. So you're now still not able to scale. So what data availability sampling does is it allows you to verify that data has been published by only downloading you know, 0.001% of the overall block data. And so rather than having to download a million transactions, which it could be like a gigabyte of data or something, you just download a few kilobytes. But you have a statistical guarantee that all that data was published. So those two things together actually make it possible for end users to verify uh, a modular blockchain on their phone. And so like, I, I, don't, I actually brought a phone that's running a Celestia node with me. Uh, and it's really cool. Like everyone, this, this is, the, to me, the end game of, of um, so this is a node that's running a, a Celestia uh, like verifying light node. And so in the future, this is, this is sort of the, the, what we imagine uh, blockchains to look like, is that end, end users on their phone are verifying the chain directly. Um, that was a really awesome breakdown. Thank you for going through all of that. Um, so I, I, asked, um, I asked Twitter what questions that they had for you. And this was, so I, I'm going to sprinkle a couple as they, as they come up in the conversation. So this is one that someone had, which is, um, could you explain what are the UX, so the user experience and latency trade-offs um, you know, that, that basically exists by passing on devs and users, uh, that are passing on devs and users due to modularity? Or like, what are, what are the trade-offs that people have to consider due to modularity? Yeah, this is a good question. I think it came from Ilya at NIR. Uh, so there's, so the thing about modular blockchains is that you're stacking, you're, you're splitting what used to be one single protocol and one set of nodes into se several different protocols that are layered on top of each other. And uh, so it does make the system kind of have more dependencies, I guess. Um, now, to the end user, there isn't, like, the, 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 when, it, when it comes to, like, latency, the main latency that matters is the uh, speed of finality of the underlying data availability layer, like Celestia or Ethereum. Because you, you won't ever have complete finality of your transaction until it's included in the base DA layer and you've sampled and verified it. So um, that doesn't really, it just, so it just depends on the underlying DA layer. And Celestia, it's only like a 15 second block time. So it's not like, it's kind of on par with existing blockchains. Um, and then beyond that, actually, let's say you wanted something faster than 15 seconds, you can still do things like having uh, soft confirmations from uh, the roll-up sequencers. So like, if you ever used Optimism or Arbitrum, you know that like, your transactions get confirmed almost instantaneously, and that's because that finality is coming from the sequencer guaranteeing you that that tra transaction has been included and executed. So you can still have, but then like, the only the final, final confirmation, right? happens on, on Ethereum L1 in, in for those, for those roll-ups. So like, the user experience doesn't necessarily have to suffer uh, at all, really. In fact, it can be as good or better than a lot of monolithic chains. Um, in terms of the uh, developer experience, there can be more complexity because you have to choose you know, which components to put together, and you have to fit them together. Um, however, the, there's a lot of work that's going on to basically, first of all, establish standard interfaces across the different layers, so it becomes very plug and play. And then there are teams like uh, Caldera or Vistara or uh, Conduit. There's a bunch of different teams doing what's called rollups as a service, which is sort of like a, uh, a, a white glove or like a, a sort of hosted uh, rollup platform in which developers don't need to know anything. They just put in a bunch of parameters and click a button 
and they get a roll-up deployed uh, on demand. So I think the developer experience is going to be, like our, our end goal, and I think where we're already almost at, is to make it as easy to, easy to deploy a roll-up as it is to deploy a smart contract, so that like, you know, there isn't really a difference between building a roll-up and b building, like deploying a normal dApp on Ethereum in the long term. How do you think about the first use cases or the first types of roll-ups or, or the first um, participants in that, that's going to be leveraging modular architecture? Do you think there's kind of a specific type where it's like, hey, that's, you know, these are, these are the types that make sense to start with and then obviously you can scale out and there are other users as well, but how do you kind of, how do you see, who do you think are the people who need it most or like most likely to adopt it first? That's a very good question. So to understand who are, are likely to adopt it, we have to talk about um, what, the, what the advantages are really quick. So like one of the first advantages we talked about is scalability. So with a modular blockchain, you can have a lot of throughput and low fees, which is uh, useful for some use cases. You also get greater customizability. So because of the fact that each of these layers can be swapped in and out, there's a, and there's a bunch of different sort of uh, versions of each layer to choose from, developers have this superpower of flexibility and customization that they don't get in a monolithic chain. So they can, you know, just like choose the exact stack that is perfectly optimized for the system. They can even, for example, customize themselves, like write custom logic at the execution layer to make things like just specific to them. Uh, so there's that level of, of control. So customizability and scale are two really uh, big advantages of the uh, modular paradigm. Now, also though, are, are like the disadvantages. So like, so starting out, what I would say is when you if you deploy your like a new rollup, the thing is that you won't be as connected, right? If you deploy a smart contract on ETH L1, right, it's it's natively interoperable. It has access to all the liquidity on ETH L1, et cetera. But if you deploy a rollup. Um, it's a new chain, and so it needs to have bridges in order to effectively have connectivity with the rest of the ecosystem. And so I think that's, that's one downside. So kind of, I guess where, where I'm like, now to like go back to your question of like, so who would be most, who would benefit most? I think it's uh, projects that benefit from scale, customizability, and don't at least for now have much, as much of a need for like, uh, direct connectivity with the existing uh, stack. So some of the things that I've seen I along these lines are there's a team called Argus, who I think is speaking tomorrow. Um, they're building uh, a stack specifically for on-chain gaming. So on-chain gaming is a good use case because games need a lot of scalability and low fees. Um, also, gaming is a use case that requires a lot of customization. So with some of the things that they've done is added uh, a very specific way in which to, to shard the game world. And they've also uh, made it possible to have a very high tick rate so that it feels, when you're playing the game, it feels like instantaneous. Um, and then another example is like Manta, which is a project um, that we'll be deploying on Celestia that is a, uh, an EVM-based rollup, but they've customized the EVM to add specific opcodes to make ZK verification more gas efficient. And so, um, and, and they're, they're more targeting like really cool like privacy use cases or uh, you know, having verifiable on-chain randomness for, for different games, like they have a, a poker game that you can play on-chain. Um, but like DeFi, for example, well, DeFi also benefits because part of customization is that you can capture more value or more MEV, um, but you want to be able to be at the stage of a DeFi app where you're like DYDX, where you have your, like an existing user base, an existing liquidity base, so that launching your own like roll-up you will, that liquidity will like migrate with you. It's like it might be hard to like have a cold start of liquidity if you're a new DeFi app. Yeah. yeah. Um, how how do you think about how bridges will work? And you know, it's obviously something that will eventually have to emerge. Um, assuming that interoperability is going to be an important thing that we you know we we uh, we keep. And again, like uh, to your point, not everything needs to be interoperable. Maybe some games can can exist very well on its own. Um, but how do you see bridges emerging, and, and you know what are what are some of the challenges there? So bridging is going to be really important in the modular stack because you have all these different rollups 
uh, that are kind of their own chain. And in order to connect the applications and the users and liquidity across those chains, you need, you need a bridge. And um, right now, the, what that, and the, the funny thing is that the superpower of rollups is that they have the ability to do something called trust minimized bridging. So in, in like typically between two separate L1 chains, you have to make a trust assumption on the other chain when you bridge. And uh, what's really cool about rollups is as long as they are deployed on the same data availability layer, they can bridge with each other without making any uh, trust assumptions on the other rollup. Now, uh, unfortunately, there's still a lot of work to be done to make rollup bridging uh, sort of practical uh, in a lot of cases. I think like once, like if we can get ZK rollups to production and at scale, I think that will solve a lot of the problems because like bridging ZK rollups is, a, is simpler and faster than uh, bridging um, uh, optimistic rollups in many cases. But there's teams like, for example, Hyperlane that uh, I'm really excited about because what they're doing is they're making it possible to deploy a bridge on your rollup by just deploying a, a set of smart contracts. And so, um, you know, the worst thing, what you don't want to do is have a world where I'm a developer, I'm building my rollup, and all of a sudden, so I built my rollup, now I have to do BD or convince some bridge team to integrate with me. And that they become like the gatekeepers of my ecosystem. And so we want to have bridging that's permissionless and very fast and easy to deploy. And um, pro projects like Hyperlane make that possible, where you can just spin up your rollup, deploy a set of smart contracts, and then connect into this whole like uh, interconnected network of, of different chains. And it's not just only specific for rollups, but also other L1s. So maybe along that vein, in terms of you know what needs to be built um, to have this really robust modular architecture take off. What are bridges we just talked about? What are some other things that you think um, need to be built in the ecosystem and um, in, in, you know, alongside what are, what are the things that you're really most excited about that's coming up? Good question. Well, um, this kind of goes back to the uh, UX problem that you talked about, uh, we talked about earlier. One aspect of user experience in sort of the future modular world that we envision is there's going to be tons and tons of different blockchains. And um, now the, the thing about that is even if, let's say, bridging is secure and, and relatively seamless, um, there's going to be so many different, you're going to have assets on all these different chains, you're going to have applications on all these different chains. Uh, and as a user, it's going to be just really, really complex. It's like a, this whole web of different dependencies and, and things going on. And so we need to find a way that abstracts a lot of that actual complexity uh, so that you don't even maybe know that there are separate chains under the hood, right? And I think, to me, one of the things I'm really excited about on that front is this uh, emerging uh, sort of idea called intents, which is that you know, a transaction the way that we interact with blockchains now is through transactions, where you uh, basically specify a set of inputs right to the chain, and then the chain goes and tells you what the output is. And an intent is, is kind of a, the reverse of that, where you specify what the output or the outcome should be, and then you authorize someone to act on your behalf and, and determine like, the inputs to make that uh, possible. And uh, what's nice about that is that as a user, you just say, this is what I want to happen, and then it kind of like magically takes place. And so you don't have to, like on the other hand, like if it's a transaction, it had to be like, okay, I want to trade, I want to take these tokens from this chain and route them through this chain to that chain, do a swap, move back, buy this NFT, you know, then <laughs> move the NFT over to here or whatever. Uh, and, and then you have to specify that exact whole trace, and that's really hard. Whereas Instead, in an intense world, you just say, hey, I want to buy this NFT. I'm willing to sell these various tokens for that. You can choose whichever ones you want. And then at the end, I want this NFT to be moved over to this like, NFT marketplace chain. And then, boom, it just happens. Yeah. Um, another question from Twitter. Um, if you had to take the devil's advocate view, then what are some reasons that you think modular blockchain would not take off? This is a good question. So I would say the devil's advocate side against modular blockchains is either that atomic composability is so important that everything just wants to live on one single chain. That's one bear case. 
Although, in theory, you could still have uh, like one massive roll-up on top of a, a, like a, a one massive DA layer like Celestia, and you kind of would end up on, in the same place. But then at that point, there's no real reason why those shouldn't just be the same protocol. Um, another uh, bear case is that um, people, the, like we believe that the, the customizability that people want mostly is that sort of like the execution layer and maybe the consensus layer, I guess. But like that, that you, don't, you don't need to tightly couple these different layers of the stack because you can kind of get the benefits of each one in an isolated way. Um, but like, if, like the bear case would be that, okay, well in order to make this one execution trade-off or optimization, we're gonna need to actually control specifically the consensus network part of this or the mempool specifically. And so, uh, and th those kind of things are, are harder to do in a modular stack because those, those different like layers are not really, uh, they're kind of independent. So those are, those are the two like bare cases I could see. Okay, um, and, and maybe now the flip side of that, since we, you know, we're, we're kind of reaching the end of our session, can you paint for the audience what you think, let's project forward, you know, 10 years into the future. What do you think, assuming modular architecture takes off, what do you think the world kind of looks like in, in, in that, in that um, if we go along this path? Well, I, lo I love this question because uh, I'm kind of a dreamer and I've like, since like, you know, five years ago when I first got into the space, have like wanted to see this end manifestation of, of blockchains come to, come to life. And uh, so in, in Celestia specifically, our vision is uh, kind of encapsulated by three words. So the first is uh, gigabyte blocks. The second is a million rollups. And the last one is one billion light nodes. And so uh, I'll explain what each one of those mean and then kind of what it means for this like broader vision of, of where crypto, where we want crypto to go. So gigabyte blocks is referring to the fact that we want to eventually scale Celestia to have gigabyte sized blocks, um, which would just be a massive amount of, of data throughput and hopefully could scale to you know, billions of actual users. Uh, and that's just, the, and I'm sure it can go beyond that, but that's sort of like the, the milestone that we've set for ourselves. Then a, a million rollups is referring to the fact that we wanna see an explosion of, of applications and, and rollups and chains, um, similar to what we saw on Ethereum uh, with, with smart contracts. And we think there's just so much more innovation and exploration to be done at that layer. And also within that, if people were actually able to deploy a million rollups, that means we've made it very easy, right? <laughs> it's like right now, it's, it's probably not that easy. It'd be very hard to imagine uh, a million different rollups being deployed. But like we c if we make it as easy to deploy as a smart contract, like every developer could just go online and write a few lines on and, 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 and a command line and, and have a rollup. And then the last one is a billion light nodes. And this is one that's very near and dear to my heart, which is that we want to build a culture where all the users of crypto are actually verifying the chain on their phones or on their browser or whatever device they're using. They're directly verifying the blockchain because that's what we came for. That's what we've been building from the beginning is a, a, like a, a user verified, user owned internet. And so uh, to make that happen, we have to integrate the Celestia Light node into different wallets. Um, we need to build the behavior for people and just in general get adoption. So that's kind of like the, the end game. And the end game is like, like I said, a user owned, user verified internet where we uh, have more like sovereignty and power and autonomy. And um, th the whole world is connected in a network of cryptographic trust um, that will scale like the economy, scale, our ability to cooperate, uh, I think lead to a more peaceful and prosperous world. So that's, that's our vision for the future of blockchain. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the time. It's such a pleasure chatting with you and, and learning more about Celestia. Thank you for breaking down everything to its granular parts and sharing your vision. Um, yeah, this is it. This is the end of the session. But thank you so much, thank Nick. Thank you. Great questions. See you guys.